Eric Linder, and together they will be talking about double source lensing cosmology. So I'll give it one second to hook up to AV. Let me know when you're ready. All right, I think we're good to go. Whenever you're ready, feel free to start. All right, great. So this is going to be a, a tag team talk. Um, myself and David Sharma, uh, who is a uh, rising senior at UC Berkeley. Um, we're gonna be talking about double source plane lensing. So this is uh, adding to the diversity of lensing that we've heard about this morning. We've heard about lensing of gravitational wave sources. We've heard about time delay lensing. We've heard about usual strong lensing. And now we're gonna talk about double source plane where two sources are lensed by the same uh, lens galaxy. And I noticed that Tom Collett is on the line and, and he's the one who really put this technique on the map. So um, I hope we'll, we'll get a little input from him as well. To use a, a British phrase talking about double source plane lensing with Tom on the line, it's sort of like bringing coal to Newcastle, but, but hopefully we'll, we'll get his input as well. So again, double source plane lensing, you have two sources that are in sufficient alignment with a foreground lens that the observer can see them both. And so therefore you have three different redshifts that are uh, in this, this um, situation. You have the lens redshift and you have two distinct source redshifts. And as you can see in the picture on the, the lower um, right, that also means you have two Einstein rings or at least two Einstein radii. Um, and the ratio of these Einstein radii, which is going to be an observable, gives you a distance ratio. To a large extent, as, as Tom, among others, pointed out, this makes it a geometric probe in that the lens model substantially is reduced. Uh, your, the sensitivity to the lens model is substantially reduced. In the case of a singular isothermal ellipse, it is exact a singular isothermal sphere. It's exactly canceled. So you don't have exact cancellation, but you do to a large extent have this pure distance ratio of the lens source distance over the lens source distance of the other source and the observer source distance over the observer source distance of the other source. So you have this nice geometric distance ratio. And of course, because it's a ratio of, of the same number of distances, you're also independent of H naught. And so that reduces some covariances there. So LSST will find about 100 of these. We expect that other surveys, such as Euclid, will find about 100. Roman uh, will find about uh, perhaps about 100 as well. Again, these numbers date back to Tom. Um, and these are from about six years ago. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to hear about some updates on the numbers expected. But the basic number to keep in mind is that you're going to get about 100 of these. Um, they play extremely well with standard single plane lenses, um, such as the time delay lenses that we've heard about. And so here you can see on the, the left plot, the uh, combination of this, this beta, this double source plane distance ratio with a standard um, uh, distance that you would get from the time delays, a, a time delay distance. And you can see that you get some, some nice uh, complementarity. Um, between those. On the right side, you can see that when you take that complementarity to uh, allow for spatial curvature to be free, you get an even stronger um, effect of this complementarity, such that you're really immunizing yourself to a large extent to marginalizing over curvature as well, which is something that's, that's very nice to, to have. The thing that I want to emphasize for the double source plane lenses is not just that it's another way of getting distances, but you're really getting a unique um, type of distance. You're getting the distance between the lens and the source. So the observer is basically removed from the picture, which means you're, you're getting sort of a remote viewing of the expansion history of the universe. Distances, expansion as seen from the lens, not the observer. And so this really changes completely the covariance between the, the cosmology parameters. And you get this very strange um, property that the equation of state, you're actually more sensitive to in some cases than the matter density. 
So in the right plot, you're seeing the sensitivities basically of um, to each parameter, to the, the uh, matter density, to the equation of state today, and to a measure of its time variation, WA. You also get these interesting nulls. So for example, if we look at the, the, uh, the black curve, the sensitivity to omega matter, that goes through a null at redshift 0.15, which means it completely drops out of the covariances. And so therefore you get the dark energy uh, um, equation of state parameters better. And there's some interesting uh, properties that you can see as you go to higher redshift. And in particular, as you go to higher redshift, you still get this, this continued sensitivity to the dark energy parameters. And in fact, you become more sensitive to WA than to, to W naught. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Divij now, who will, will elaborate on that and then talk a little bit about the data. So Divij. Hi. So yes, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so for our study, we used a fiducial choice of lens and source redshift ratios. Uh, so we used a ratio of source one redshift to lens redshift to be two and source two redshift to source one redshift to be 1.5. These ratios correspond roughly to the peak of the lensing focal length kernel. That is, they're the most efficient and hence most commonly detected ratios but the plots on these slides will further motivate our choice of these ratios. So there are very few DSPL currently known, but we can explore the practicality of the source to lens redshift using known single plane strong lenses. So the left panel plot is showing a plot of the redshift ratio for around 1800 galaxy galaxy and around 120 quasar galaxy strong lenses. So we can see uh, from the plot that our fiducial choice of a ratio of two is reasonable. It gives a conservative lower limit. Uh, and we will study a variation of this ratio in a later slide. As for the redshift ratio between the two sources, we will see in a later slide on figure of merit isocontours that this ratio will give the most conservative dark energy constraints. Moreover, as you can see on the right plot, a nice property of beta for the conditions given is that beta is nearly constant with deviations remaining less than 1% out to a lens stretch shift of two. So there is negligible difference between taking an absolute measurement precision or a fractional measure measurement precision. Next slide. So in this plot, we are focusing on the dark energy equation of state space to consider how observations at different directions affect the constraints on WA and W naught. So as you can see in the plot, it shows that the covariance direction of the constraints in the state space rotates as the lens redshift is increasing. For example, near the WA sensitivity null at a redshift of 0.23, we see that the solid contours become vertical, indicating strong W naught constraints. Similarly, at a redshift of 2.1, which is the W naught sensitivity null that we saw a couple slides back, the solid contours become horizontal, indicating strong WA constraints. This steady rotation also holds when we marginalize over omega m, as we have done throughout our plots. And this shows complementarity over a range of redshifts. So we expect high redshift measurements to have good complementarity with lower redshift ones, and broad redshift surveys should use this probe effectively. On these slides, on this slide, on this slide, we are exploring the complementarity of DSPL further. In particular, uh, in these plots, we explore the complementarity between different lens redshift ranges, as well as complementarity with other distance probes. So, on the left panel, we can see an explicit complementarity between different lens lens redshift ranges. So, we have used a redshift range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.6. 0.6 to 1.1, as well as 0.1 to 1.1 for DSPL. And we can see that the redshift range of 0.1 to 1.1 shows the others very good complementarity. We have quantified these improvements using the dark energy figure of merit, which is inversely proportional to the area of the ellipse. And so the last redshift bin show, implies the tightest constraints on WA and W naught. On the right panel, we have combined DSPL with other co conventional distances. Here we have used supernovae distances. The black contour is the same on both plots. 
And on the right plot, we can see that DSPO offers complementarity with these distance probes. As you can see that the ellipse are shrinking in size or the figure of merit is increasing, implying tighter constraints on W and W naught. On, so on the right plot, we can see that as we increase the lens redshift range to 1.6, the ellipses are shrinking further, tightening the constraints on WA and W naught. So LSST plus Roman or Euclid could go out to a lens redshift of 1.6, which tightens dark energy constraints, as we saw on the right plot in previous slide. In this plot, we are exploring how our results would change if we were to use different source source or source lens redshift ratios. So here we have uh, plotted figure of merit isocontours for information using the lens redshift range of 0 0.1 to 1.6, as well as adding CMB and supernova information. And uh, as you can see, our fiducial ratio choice of source source and lens source redshift gives a conservative lower estimate on dark energy constraints using double source plane lensing. So we can improve the figure of merit if we go out to a lens redshift of 1.6 or if we don't use our conservative fiducial source redshift ratio. So above a redshift of two, there should still be dark energy to detect. At such high redshift, dark energy is at one to 20% of the critical energy density within the Lambda CDM model. In this plot, we probe the range of source distribution taken to be out to a redshift of five. To allow extra freedom at high redshift, instead of using W0 and WA, we are allowing dark energy to float freely in redshift bins. That is, we are taking param parameters, matter energy density, as well as dark energy density uh, centered at five bins. The bins being 1.1 to 1.4, 1.4 to 1.7, 1.7 to 2, 2 to 2.5 and 2.5 to 5. Uh, so the solid band uh, projects the constraints. And as you can see, it's a 68% confidence level band. And the detection of dark energy is possible out to a redshift of 5. And the deviations from lambda CDM are tightly constrained. OK, so I'll sum up. Um, it's always great to have new probes and new geometric probes, purely distance probes where you're less sensitive to growth of structure or to lens modeling um, are especially valuable. Um, double source plane lensing has this very intriguing property of this remote seeing where, where you're basically canceling out the observer um, to some extent. And so you're seeing what the expansion history was at especially high redshift. It has beautiful complementarity with the other probes, including time delay lensing. Um, LSST will be excellent as a wide field uh, finder for these finding hundreds. Um, you of course don't have to find everything. You don't have to use everything you find. You can choose only the best. Um, here we were talking about 100 to 200 in total that we used. And in particular, we want to advocate that people who are designing the, the pipelines for the uh, image analysis and, um, uh, and, and uh, light curve analysis should keep the double source plane lenses in mind. LSST will also be very good at removing some systematics such as line of sight mass. You will also need spectroscopic surveys to follow up to nail down the redshifts to evaluate the, the lens models and their residual impact in the galaxy kinematics. But I think LSST will be excellent for bringing us from, from three to hundreds of these very interesting double source plane lens probes. Thank you. Thank We're you. Open for questions, questions for either Eric and Divij. Very nice talk, uh, Eric and Divich. This is Simon Beer uh, speaking. Uh, more speculative question. Do we only have to focus on double source plane lenses to do this tomography, or can we just use the entire population of lenses? Say you have a self-similar deflector and the sources happen to be a different redshift, such as like in stacking a pseudo multiplane uh, lens configuration. Is also something that could be feasible. I just speculate in here. 
so you're saying stacking so so you're stacking many single plane lenses is that what you're doing correct so if you have like thousands of lenses you may find a hundred self-similar lenses whatever self-similar means and then you effectively can pseudo stack that the source redshifts are at different redshifts and so i i confess that that that's a completely new idea to me that that i hadn't thought of i i would have some hesitation in in that if the lens is you know it's registering the centers of the lenses and getting the lens model similar enough but it's it's interesting enough to certainly try um i don't know maybe other people have, have thought more about that yeah thank you yeah i just also thinking loud about these things yeah thank you Thomas, if you have a question, feel free to unmute and ask it. Cool, thanks. Um, on, on Simon's point, I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. It's just a question of how standardizable are lenses. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, seeing the cool stuff you've done with looking at freeform dark energy, can you also use this as a way of, of probing cosmic curvature as a function of redshift? Um, I'm thinking about these back reaction models that some people think can can explain cause uh, dark energy. Eric, are you frozen? Yeah, Div, can you, uh, Divish, can you answer this? Or is he frozen too? No, he's not frozen. No, um, so I actually have, I don't know if we could. Uh, I think Eric would be the right person to answer that question. I don't, I would not know if he can probe curvature also. Well, hopefully we can maybe talk another time when uh, Eric's internet's working. Yes, for sure. your advisor immediately drop off for the question section. <laughs> but but uh, let's see, maybe maybe we should save the rest of the questions uh, for later in the day once he's able to get back online. So with that, let's give another round of applause to Divij and Eric. <laughs>